Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by Jacopo Bongiorno, who is uh, a TEPCO professor in nuclear engineering at MIT. Jacopo and I uh, had the pleasure of meeting each other um, at the MIT, I'm going to blank on the name of this, but it was a, uh, a nuclear education workshop. Do you, do you remember what it was called, Jacopo? I imagine you do as you organized it. It's a course on uh, nuclear energy um, in a carbon-constrained world, um, facts and issues. I think that's the official title of the course. It's a three-day program that you and uh, 60 other people attended to learn about um, basic facts and issues about nuclear energy. I, I did get a participation medal that I'm very proud of. Um, it, it's like a, you know, a little certification. I felt quite proud of that. It's not quite framed in the office next to my medical degree, but I think it's uh, you know the first kind of formal training that I have in nuclear. So uh, that was great. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and it, it was good times. Um, that was great to have that's you a, there. That is a bare bones introduction. Um, you've got a long and storied and, and fascinating career. Um, so just uh, take a minute or two just to introduce yourself a, a little bit further to the audience. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me here. It's, uh, it's uh, great to reconnect. I look forward to the conversation. So as you said, I'm um, on the faculty in the Department of Nuclear Science and Engineering here at MIT. I've been at the Institute for close to 20 years. All my background is in uh, nuclear engineering. I grew up, as you may gather from my last name and my accent, in Italy. Um, I did my undergraduate um, uh, studies there in nuclear engineering. Then I came over to the U.S. for my doctorate, and I realized job opportunities here in my field were much better and decided to stay. Um, I, uh, you know, in uh, the course of my career, of course, as a professor, you, you teach, but you also do research. So I started uh, my research program with um, uh, topics that are fairly narrow, specialized on the thermal hydraulics, you know, basically the, the ability of a fluid to transfer energy from the core of a nuclear reactor to other parts of the plant and studying with my students really sort of the detail of those physical phenomena. And then roughly 10 years ago, I progressively started to shift towards more techno-economic analysis of uh, of nuclear technologies. So to boil it down in one sentence, what is it going to take for nuclear energy technologies to have an impact on the big challenges that we're facing as humanity in the 21st century? Well, that's definitely the focus of uh, our podcast. So it's great to have you on to discuss that. Just briefly, um, you are from Italy. Uh, Italy has a uh, nuclear ban as a result of a referendum right after Chernobyl. Um, I've heard that there's uh, a reconsideration going on right now, probably with the impact of the uh, the energy crisis. But just briefly, do you have any updates for us on, on what's happening in Italy? Yeah, there, there seems to be a, uh, a resurgence of interest uh, at the highest level, actually. The prime minister and uh, the f several members of, of, of our cabinet um, have expressed a, uh, a desire for Italy to reconsider nuclear fission as part of one of the uh, future energy technologies. I've actually been invited to a workshop uh, with, uh, with, with, with some uh, politicians as well as uh, uh, members of industry that would presumably participate in a you know resurrected uh, nuclear energy program um, in the U.S. and uh, that's going to happen in a couple of weeks. So when I come back, I'll be able to tell you more. Um, what generally concerns me about Italy having you know um, been born there and grew up there is a politically not very stable country. Uh, decisions are made, and then you know a new government or a new administration comes in and the decisions are reversed. So what, what's lacking in Italy and unfortunately many other countries, this sort of long-term stability of decision-making, which I think is one of the premises for nuclear energy programs to be successful, particularly of the type, of the traditional types. You know, when you're looking at large-scale reactors that require a decade or so from, from, the, from the time you start planning and then licensing and then building and all of that. So, so that's one point of concern. But it's certainly good to see that in Italy, as well as many other countries, now there is a, uh, uh, you know, a, a growth of, uh, of interest for, for nuclear and, uh, and um, hopefully something good will come out of it. So, you know, listen, I, th I think the uh, anti-nuclear arguments have shifted, not entirely, but largely away from fear, uncertainty and doubt around radiation and accidents, obviously still a big preoccupation with waste. But I think the most compelling arguments that they're making and the loudest ones these days have to do with the cost and schedule challenges uh, of nuclear, particularly in the West. And, and, and that's an area of, of interest for you. Uh, we were just talking about this report, uh, the future of nuclear energy in a carbon constrained world. Uh, and that was the focus of the talk you gave at MIT and, and why I'm excited to talk to you today. Um, 
you know, a, a big theme is obviously the the regional differences. That was a slide of yours that really stood out, uh, just comparing the the kind of cost per kilowatt, um, you know, in the West versus uh, in Asia and Russia. Um, you know, and we're going to break this down in a lot more detail. Um, but that always that hasn't always been the case. Obviously, the West did deploy, um, I think, in a fairly cost competitive manner to contemporary deployments um, in in the East and in Russia. Um, but what, what do you see as the, the big explainer there um, in terms of uh, the skills that the West has lost? Well, quite simply, uh, what has happened is that the nuclear industry in the U.S. and Western Europe did not build new nuclear power plants for between 20 and 30 years. In the U.S., for literally 30 years. In, in, uh, in some countries in, in Europe, for a little bit shorter than that. And, and during that period, a lot of capabilities that are necessary for new nuclear power plants to be built uh, cost effectively and and on time on schedule uh, were lost. Um, this was obviously not the case in in countries that have continuously um, uh, been growing their nuclear capacity. I'm thinking, of course, of South Korea and China above all, but also Russia and other regions of the world. And if you look at the um, uh, schedule and a cost associated with those projects in those other countries, you can see that, uh, you know, they managed to keep it uh, quite, quite reasonable. So I think it's been, you know, the, the, the main culprit for, uh, for the poor performance of the new construction projects that we have witnessed, that we have observed in the U.S. and Western Europe for the past decade is really these long hiatus during which uh, a lot of capabilities in terms of supply chain, workforce, the ability to manage uh, large sprawling construction uh, sites with thousands of workers, et cetera, uh, those capabilities were lost. So, I mean, beyond that, I, th- I think that's, you know, probably the most consequential and the most obvious. Uh, but in terms of getting into a little more detail and subtlety, um, it seems to me that the successful contemporary programs um, are often state-led or significant um, role of the state and, and often more of an, in a vertical integration model. Um Do you feel like that's something that was present? I mean, I know in Ontario, we had a collaboration between Atomic Energy of Canada's Limited and and Ontario Hydro, a utility and and essentially a construction company is kind of how it was referred to, despite being primarily utility. But um, do you see that as being a a major issue? I know in the U.S. there's an aversion, I think, to um, government involvement um, in terms of, you know, having a national industrial policy centered around nuclear. It's more, I think, kind of reactive in terms of uh, the loan program office looking at financing projects, but in no way sort of coordinating or directing them. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, on that theme? Well, that, that's that's a great question, Chris. I I don't think the issue was lack of government um, involvement. Um, I mean, the government certainly uh, here in the U.S. did certain took certain actions that actually helped sort of um, recreate an interest and 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 promote. The construction of nuclear power plants. I'm thinking in particular about the uh, um, nuclear power 2010 program in the first decade of the of the 21st century, and then the loan guarantee uh, program, which has actually been used by uh, by the projects down in the south. Um, Vogel being the the one that was actually eventually com- completed. Um, but uh, it, but you put your finger on a very important topic, and that is how these projects were structured in the West, particularly in the United States. And uh, how does that differ from the way they're typically structured in places where those projects are completed on time and on budget, uh, like South Korea, uh, China, Russia, et cetera. So in those countries, uh, these projects tend to be a lot more vertically integrated. The company that designs, uh, that develops the technology, designs the plant, builds the plant, often is the same company that actually owns and operates the plant. Um, and, and what that does is from the very beginning, you have the fabricators and constructors, the supply chain, very much integrated in the design team. Um, so what that does, it ensures that whatever is designed, the, the reactor or the plant that is designed, is constructible. Um, and that's hugely important because once you sort of pull the trigger and you decide to launch your project and you start to deploy 5,000 workers, and you open this sprawling construction site, well, the clocks start to to tick, and the money starts to flow. And the last thing you want is to have sort of a back and forth between the technology developer and the constructor to sort of finalize the design, the the, the nitty-gritty detailed design down to the blueprints that are required uh, to actually build the plant. So you want 
all that work to be done and be um, officially done and agreed upon the different parties up front. And that, if you look at the way they do things in, in those countries, is done very well because there is that integrated team um, that is formed from the very beginning. In the U.S., if you look at the projects down in, uh, you know, in, in Georgia and, and South Carolina, it was not done that way at all. You had a technology developer, uh, Westinghouse, and you had uh, constructors, and then you had a, a you know, utility that was the ultimate, the ultimate customers. And, and there are several instances in which uh, components and systems for the AP1000, which is that, uh, you know, the, the model of the reactor that was built there, uh, in which they were designed by Westinghouse, and uh, then passed that design was passed to the supplier, and supplier could not make it, could not deliver it, because they're not being sort of um, integrated in that in that design process from the very beginning. So that that coordination is absolutely important. So the way the way it's structured uh, does make us uh, does make a difference. The other facet of this, uh, Chris, is um, is also all parties within the team must have um, similar incentives for the success of the project. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. I'm not a, uh, you know, a contract uh, specialist. Um, and I've never managed myself, <laughs> you know, uh, mega projects. But it seems to me that all the parties, all the companies involved uh, within these projects uh, must march a line in coordinated fashion towards the successful completion of the project. When I say successful, it means on budget, and on time. And there must be rewards for everybody to meet that target. And, and that's, that was not, by my observation and the observation of others, uh, the case for the projects in the United States, where you could argue that uh, some parties would actually have an incentive in stretching the duration of the project because they were making more money out of that, you know, reworks and things of that type. And so that, that can't be the case. And I think in in Asia, it's not the case. They 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 clearly have because it's essentially one integrated team. They 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 march along. They march along efficiently. So w- one of the um, elements of the report is is kind of a cost breakdown um, of nuclear construction, and it, it seems like the actual nuclear supply system, steam supply system, is is not the major cost. So how how does that break down? Because I think in in your report, there's a kind of de-emphasis on reactor design uh, and, you know, an advocacy for more of a focus on constructability. Yeah, in a way there is. And I have to tell you, it's a little bit frustrating because as a nuclear engineer, there is nothing more entertaining and gratifying than coming up with beautiful new reactor designs, right? We love to work on fuels and moderators and coolants and uh, control systems and operating conditions and all that. That's the fun part for nuclear engineers. But it was a little bit of an epiphany for me and I think many other members of the team when during the study, through interviews and and, uh, analyzing the breakdown of the cost for this projects, we realized that only 20 to 25% of the total capital cost, basically the cost of building the plant, is associated with the direct cost of the equipment. Uh, You know, the vessels, the pipes, the uh, control rods, uh, the support, and all of that. And and so that's, you can do your best job with that, but it's not going to move more than a quarter of the total cost. Um, In turn, what we found is that roughly half of the cost is in the actual installation, if you will, um, of, the, of, the, of the reactor itself. And what do we mean by that? We mean uh, the site preparation, all the excavation work that has to be done, all the civil works associated with uh, you know, uh, building a nuclear power plant, which mostly means erecting concrete structures. And for the nuclear island, um, erecting reinforced concrete nuclear grade uh, structures or nuclear grade co- uh, reinforced concrete structures. Um, and all the labor associated with it, all the uh, site oversight associated with it. That's where the bulk of the cost is. Roughly half of it is there. Then you look at the other sort of quarter left there, and that's roughly divided in two parts. One is the um, um, uh, engineering, uh, the engineer, the design and engineering part, uh, which you know largely is done 
in, in fact, hopefully is done almost entirely upfront and largely is site independent, but there is always some site dependent, site specific engineering work that has to be done. And that's, by the way, another sort of a downside of the current approach is that there is no such thing as a truly standardized nuclear power plant, unfortunately, because if you put it at site A versus site B, at a minimum, you got to deal with the differences in uh, uh, peak ground acceleration with the seismic. Uh, profile of that particular site, as well as any other sort of external hazards. But the, but, but the point being um, that uh, the engineering uh, cost is roughly maybe uh, 12, 15 percent, and, and that's, so that's also significant. And then lastly, you have what, what I would call owner, or what we called owner's cost. And so these are things like the cost of the land, insurance. Now, if, and, and this is sort of overnight construction cost breakdown. If you then pick or, or you put on top of it also the financing, which really means interest during construction, um, then the uh, share of the total cost that is not directly related to the reactor itself, to the equipment, to the design of the, of the reactor itself becomes even larger. So the implication of all of this, Chris, is that if we want to reduce the cost of these plants, we need to attack those cost drivers. It's not enough to have a better mousetrap, you know, a, a more... Uh, a, 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 a more clever um, nuclear reactor design, what you really need to attack are some fairly mundane things like how do I build large reinforced concrete structures at lower cost? And how do I manage the, you know, how do I manage the, the construction site better and all of them? So I, I definitely want to chat up some of the nitty gritty of that and, you know, some of the advances in terms of steel bricks and, and opportunities for modularization. But first, um, I want to get a sense of uh, whether or not, I mean, you think that there's something uniquely hard or special about nuclear construction versus hydro dams, bridges, airports. All of them have specialized needs and quirks. Um, but would you say nuclear construction is is unique in some way or uniquely difficult? I mean, regulatory environment's tough, but what's your take? I would say 80% similar. And, and, uh, and so two observations here. As part of the study, we quickly reviewed what is the productivity of different sectors of the economy in the United States, right? And we found that the productivity, you can define that as, you know, uh, value of, uh, in terms of dollars per, per hour work. Okay, and we found that the productivity in the construction sector actually peaked in the mid 1960s in the United States, and then has been declining uh, steadily since then. Um, by contrast, uh, the productivity, for example, the manufacturing sector, which means factories, has skyrocketed, has gone up by a factor of eight or ten over the same period of time. So now, who builds nuclear power plants? Well, the components, the individual pieces, might be made in factories, and we can argue if you know our factories are efficient. They seem to be efficient. As you get to large components, they are not the factories that make the iPhones or factories that make, you know, millions of pieces per year. So they might not actually be as efficient as the average manufacturing factory. But the bulk of the plant is built by the construction sector. And the construction sector, unfortunately, is not a very, um, a very, productive, um, a very productive environment. So that is independent of nuclear. And... and and, and so that's something to, to ponder on. So do we want the manufacturing sector to build nuclear plants or we want the construction sector? Now, inevitably, it will be a combination of both. But at the moment, is heavily skewed towards construction and not manufacturing. And I think if we want to see uh, cost decline in the U.S., we need to probably shift scope, larger shares of the scope of the project towards, towards manufacturing. Um, the, the, so, so the second observation is that when projects become of a certain size, uh, what people in, in the literature call mega projects, um, and I, I forgot what the exact definition is. I think it used to be greater than a billion dollars. Now, a billion dollar now is no longer what it used to be maybe 10 years ago. So let's say greater than three or four billion dollars. But when it becomes a large infrastructure project uh, with a multiple stakeholders, multiple companies involved, a tough regulatory environment, all of that, then whether it's nuclear or non-nuclear, the statistics quite clearly show that these projects tend to be chronically uh, late and experience cost overruns. So again, in a way, it's, it doesn't seem to be a very nuclear-specific, uh, a very nuclear-specific issue. So having said that, there is something that I think is uniquely tough about nuclear, and you alluded to it, is the regulatory environment. Right. 
and so the uh, uh, the attention to safety, which I think is, in, in, you know, overall of course appropriate, uh, is such that there is very little versatility and flexibility within that system to accommodate small changes, in particular small changes during construction, um, that would allow the project to move forward as opposed to stopping it for months at a time, waiting for those changes, those design changes to be approved by the NRC. And again, needless to say, when you have so many companies involved, so many workers at the site, Yes, you can stop the work for two or three months, but you're still paying your workers and you still got to sort of uh, pay, pay the suppliers. And so that, that's what accumulates cost and, and delays in the schedule. So the, the, the regulator, if you, if, you know, if you examine these particular projects in, uh, in, in the South, um, it's not that the regulator intentionally derailed it, but it was what I would call an aggravating factor. In addition to the self-inflicted wounds by the industry, the fact that their supply chain was not ready, you know, that they lost a lot of know-how, they quite clearly didn't know how to manage a big site uh, uh, like that. In addition to that, this sort of stiffness in the regulatory projects uh, by which it was very difficult to approve small changes to design as they were occurring in the field uh, also uh, aggravated the situation. I think a, a concrete example I heard, no pun intended, um, was uh, it might have been on the base the mat concrete, itself. The rebar. The rebar. <laughs> yeah. Can, can, you, can you tell that story really quickly? Because I think that's pretty illustrative. Yeah. Um, so, so the story is that the, um, the AP1000 uh, licensing path was based on what we call PAR52. Um, that is the combined construction operating license. So instead of being a two-step process in which the uh, applicant goes to the NRC and says, allow me to build the plant, then it builds the plant, goes back to the NRC, says, now allow me to operate it. That's the old-fashioned Part 50. What the companies decided for this project was to do Part 52, combined one step. So they went to the NRC and said, allow me to build and then operate the plant. That sounds good. It sounds like progress. It sounds better because it's one step instead of two steps. Um, and I think it is progress, but it's not progress, it's, but it carries some risk if it's for a design or a product that you never built before. Why is that? Because you can do a, a very good job in designing your plant, putting a lot of thinking, do a lot of analysis, but until you actually try to build it, you don't know that that's the ideal design. Inevitably, you want to make some changes or you must make some changes. And with PAR 52, once your design is certified and the NRC has approved both construction and operation, uh, in order to make changes, you need an amendment to that design certification. And that takes time. It requires basically a lengthy analysis by the NRC. And I believe, don't quote me, but I think it also requires a vote by the commission. So it's lengthy. And again, it stops the project in its track. So now getting to the story. So what happened with the AP-1000 is that they put a lot of details about the uh, uh, reinforced concrete structures, the nuclear-grade reinforced concrete structures. And because they're nuclear-grade and they have to withstand certain loads, for example, a commercial airliner crash into the containment, et cetera, um, uh, the uh, uh, density of the, of the reinforcement, which is in, in the form of steel rebar within the concrete, has to be very, very high which, by the way, creates already a challenge in, in uh, uh, constructing those structures because uh, there is a difficulty for the, for the concrete to basically flow in between the rebar, and then it has to be you know, uh, uh, vibrated and ensure that there are no, no voids so that you have a, structural, a structurally sound uh, uh, building. Uh, but so what happened is that they had specified the angle at which these rebar would be with respect to each other. And, and uh, for, for reasons that I don't quite know, um, it, the, uh, the, uh, th the range within which that angle had to be specified or was specified was pretty tight. And so what happened was that when they actually, uh, in the field, built, or started to build the structures, and they measured the angle of those rebar was a little bit off that range. And, well... That required a, an amendment to the design certification. And essentially, uh, they decided that it was easier to just strip it off and then report. So that set them back several months. And of course, uh, God knows how many 
hundreds of millions of dollars, not because of the cost of that job, but because of the, uh, you know, the, the, the delay in the schedule, of course, and then the interest that, that was paid and all of that. No, I mean, I've, I've seen some videos of, uh, I believe, uh, you know, the uh, nuclear base mat and just the density of, of rebar is insane. I, you know, I'm thinking of using a jackhammer to break that up. I'm sure there's more sophisticated methods, but uh, sounds like one hell of a headache. Um, so, so another, another feature is, and this is something that was new to me. Um, so there's a degree of completeness to the design to get it licensed, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the design is complete from a construction perspective. Um, can you just go into that really briefly? Yeah, again, for design certification is a, um, th- the amount of information that goes into the design certification is, is vast, but it's by and large uh, geared towards demonstrating to the NRC your safety case. Uh, it, it's it's not the amount of information required to actually build the plant. Uh, for a fabricator or constructor to build the plant in the field or in a factory, whatever components are built, they need blueprints, right? And blueprints are down to the nitty-gritty details of all the tolerances and all the dimensions are specified, of all the materials are specified, and all of that. So, so what happened was that the AP1000 was or is a design, as a certified design. And so... The Westinghouse went through with the NRC a lot of iterations and analysis to show that the plant would be would be safe. Um, but then, uh, when they decided to build it, uh, they had to start creating those, for lack of a better word, those blueprints, right? Those detailed designs, and uh, and, and so that that took time, of course. Um, and uh, the uh, w- what happened with with Westinghouse, but similarly with you know the projects in the U.S., but similarly with the projects in the, in Europe, is that the companies actually broke ground and started uh, building the plant without that detailed design being very close to completion. Um, I, I actually forgot the percentages, but they were around fifty percent in some cases. I think a couple of cases in Europe even less than fifty percent. So. In one word, the plant was not fully designed in all its details before they started building it. By contrast, in the uh, countries that we've mentioned already a few times, like China, South Korea, and even Russia, when they start, when they break ground, they start actually building the plant, they have north of 90%, 95% of their detailed design uh, completed. And and it shows, because then, then you know what you're building. Now, again, in fairness, you can do that uh, easier if you have already built that plant before, right? And this was the first time that that uh, that the AP1000 was built in the United States, and similarly the EPR in Europe. Um, but but again, the decision to sort of rush to construction instead of finishing that detailed design in hindsight definitely was a poor decision. Right, right. I think Einstein has a quote about you know if you had a uh, hundred hours or hundred days to solve a project, uh, to solve a problem, spend ninety five days planning and, and five days executing. Uh, kind of only when you're you're ready to go. Um, I mean that that must mean that there's a significant advantage, obviously, to second or nth of a kind um, compared to novel technologies. It seems like there's a real first mover advantage. Um, it's you know in terms of the X300, for instance, um, significant momentum there because it seems to be the first reactor of its type, the first grid scale SMR that's going to be deployed. Um, Similarly, there seems like there's a big advantage to building another AP1000, given that that part of the headache is is gone. You've, you've actually built one. You've got a fully completed set of blueprints. As you said, they'll be slightly modified depending on the site and the seismicity, et cetera. But that, that seems just an obvious truism. I'm not even sure if it's a question for you. I, I would agree. I mean, rationally, now that we have, uh, we as in the US and, and uh, the companies involved have gone through the pain of those first couple of projects, uh, why not insisting with that design and 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 leveraging whatever expertise has been gathered and remains from those projects? But but it, and so why bother with small modular reactors, smaller reactors, and micro reactors, and all of that? And 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 I think the answer there is twofold. First, these first projects have been so dramatically bad in terms of execution and in terms of cost overruns and schedule delays, that I think, particularly in the investment community, but maybe even the, you know, in, in the electric utility community, they've left such a um, bitter taste in the mouth, and now there is very little appetite uh, for, for more of that. And I, you know, I can imagine that this boils down to a CEO who might even be 
convinced about the rational argument that we're making here. It says, okay, well, that was the first project. Now I know how to build them. Let me build another one. Um, going to their board and say, you know, let me, let me spend $15 billion on this project. And they say, well, wait a minute. We've just seen what happened at Vogel. We've just seen what happened at Summer. Um, it doesn't seem like a, uh, like a likely proposition. So, uh, so, so, so that's the first point. I, I think the perceptions have been so bad about these projects that, that it's going to be hard to sell uh, large reactors again, at least here in the U.S. Uh, you, you know, at the, the risk of sounding like a broken record, you go to the other countries, South Korea, China, Russia, they, they keep building large light water reactors. They're also looking at advanced reactors, generation four, small modular, just like us. But uh, in their case, it makes a ton of sense to just continue to... To, to build large light wire because they're obviously pretty good at it. The, the second point for why I think there is value in um, looking at alternative technologies is that the grid is an important market, but it's not the only market for nuclear. And, and, uh, and, and if you want to penetrate, uh, for example, the heat market um, for processes, for chemical plants, uh, for refineries, for whatever it is, uh, then I'm not convinced that large light water reactors are the right product. So what you probably want is uh, smaller reactors because the needs are not, you know, maybe a site doesn't need a gigawatt, but also you need maybe reactors um, that produce heat at the right temperature to support uh, to support those processes. So I think if you, you know, if you combine those two reasons, it's unlikely that we'll see a large light water reactor in the U.S., maybe in North America for the for the foreseeable future. After this first... Uh, wave of new construction is completed, particularly if it's successful. I think there might be a different perception about nuclear, and then people will will start to uh, reconsider um, large light water reactors. I mean, I, I guess it certainly helps having you know ongoing increasing demand, and that can justify these big chunky expenditures. Um, and also, if there's other factors at play, like constrained fossil fuel resources, or maybe an excess of exportable fossil fuels that, that justify deployment. Maybe we'll talk more about the, the rationale and whether the climate imperative um, is enough um, to get things going. And certainly it's led to uh, some changes, uh, for example, in the Inflation Reduction Act to try and incentivize it. Before we get there, though, uh, just while we're still on the kind of construction side of things, uh, modularity, huge buzzword recently, um, you know, and, and obviously there's always going to be a civil works component, but maybe there's a way to shift to a higher percentage of modularity. Um, and then some advances, I guess, in terms of construction, whether that's steel bricks or, you know, it seems like there's a move towards uh, burying um, the nuclear uh, steam supply system to reduce uh, the amount of uh, concrete or, or civil works required. So maybe we'll start with um, with this question of modularity. It's, it's certainly become a major part of the branding. Uh, I really don't like the term SMR, particularly, you know, talking with politicians who are non-experts. They seem to think that an SMR is just like a Model T Ford and can just be driven to the site and just set down there nice and gently and, you know, you're all done. Um, your thoughts, I guess, on on modularity, its promise, its limits? Yeah, yeah, great, great, great question or a great, great topic. So for, uh, actually, let me start from, uh, from, from the last statement you made. Um, is, there a, is there a nuclear space and equivalent of the T4 or the Ford? I think there is, but, that, but it's not the small modular reactor. It's is the... Uh, plug and play transportable micro reactors i call them nuclear batteries so now you're down to a scale uh, you know a few megawatts output and to a physical scale that can actually be transported in one or multiple pieces uh, to a site on the back of trucks so now it starts to approach that idea that you have sort of a uh, a plug and play uh, factory made uh, machine that you can that you can literally uh, uh, quickly connect and use and use for your energy needs. Uh, but setting that aside, let's talk about modularity and small modular reactors. So, so what do we mean by modularity? Well, it's a word that means different things to different people. But um, when we looked at this from a construction point of view, what it means is the following. In traditional approach for the construction of nuclear power plants, you bring raw materials and you bring individual components to the site, and then you start assembling your plant at the site. That's sort of stick built. That's tradition. When you hear the word modular construction in nuclear, what is meant is now that you pre-assemble, prefabricate large modules, so entire systems or subsystems within the uh, within the plant, in high productivity environments. And what I mean by that is either factories or uh, or uh, or shipyards, which are 
the marine and equivalent of factories. And then you uh, transport those large modules to the site and you connect those modules at the site. There is still a need for uh, for for civil works, and I'm going to address that in a second because you brought up you know steel bricks and steel plate composites and things like that. But the bulk of the plant and all its subsystems are pre-assembled in factories or shipyards, and then shipped to the site in large chunks and connected, as opposed to assembled at the site. So what this does is shifts part of the hopefully a significant chunk of the of the project from the construction site, which we said over and over again is a low productivity environment, to factories and shipyards, which are much more efficient environments. So that's the uh, uh, that's the approach. Now, in, in our study, we looked at this model, which of course was not invented by the nuclear industry in the past 10 years, being used by other industries uh, for many years. And we've observed that... Um, in, in some cases, it has been transformational. And what I mean by that, now people should not have, you know, ridiculous expectations. But when I say transformational, it means we've seen a range of cost reduction associated with modularity between 10 and 50%. Now, 50% is massive. 10% is good. You know, it's probably something to write home about. Uh, it doesn't blow you away, but it is, it is good. So... That's the range. That's a big range. But, you know, this has been applied, for example, to chemical plants. Chemical plants, in many instances these days, are built in, in big modules. And re- when I say big, I really, big, I really mean big. They don't, they don't travel on a road. They have to travel by, by barge, right? So right. really massive. And then when they arrive to the site, they are, they are, they are connected. Um, interestingly, uh, nuclear submarines in the U.S. now are built in a much more modular fashion. Uh, you know, at places like Newport News or Groton Electric Boat, they they preassemble uh, large subsystems uh, in the shop, and then they bring it out to the dry dock, which is their equivalent of the construction site, right? And there is the one three eight. You might have heard the one three eight rule for shipyards. If it takes one hour to do a task in the shop, it takes three hours outside. It takes eight hours if you do it in the dry dock, right? So, so again, there is this this desire to shift as much as possible to a an enclosed environment which is which is efficient that looks like a factor. So all, all of that is good and it's part of the modularity. Now, even with this approach to modularity, you're still going to need to build the bones of the plant, which means the uh, you know if it's a uh, a nuclear plant, you have a, a reinforced concrete structure for sure that is required to take the blast from a uh, uh, or, or the impact from a, from a commercial airline or things like that or the external events, and so. How do you reduce the cost of that? Well, there too, the idea is to shift scope of work from the, from the construction site to factories. And the way to do it for civil works is to potentially is to use these uh, composites. So a, a traditional reinforced concrete uh, structure is built essentially in four steps. First, you create a rebar cage. We already talked about, and that's steel. Um, then you have formwork, typically wood formwork. That's sort of uh, creates the shape of the structure. Then you pour the concrete, and you gotta let it set and vibrate it, and again make sure that it's it's at the right quality. And finally, you strip off the uh, the formwork. Um, very lengthy, labor intensive four steps. The idea of the steel plate composites, you can call them steel brick, or some people just call them uh, uh, steel steel composites, is that you prefabricate boxes, essentially steel boxes, in factories. And then you ship those to the site. They have the proper reinforcement built in in the, for, in, in the form of crossbars within these boxes. And then once they get to the, to, to the site, they are welded together. You can do that robotically. So that saves also you know, time and, and labor cost. Um, and then pour the, uh, the concrete into the, uh, into the boxes. And off you go with another layer. Okay? And so that's one, one approach that has been looked at. Um, another approach that, is, um, that I think is promising for reducing the cost and, and schedule of reinforced concrete is to use high-strength rebar. So if the steel rebar that you put in the, in the concrete has a higher strength, then you don't need as a dense rebar cage as you do with the lower strength. And, and that does a few things for you. The first, first of all, it reduces the, uh, the risk of having to re-pour the concrete because the, the concrete uh, 
uh, flows very very nicely in it. And number two, the in the the increasing strength of the rebar is such that even if on a per unit mass of steel, the high strength steel is more expensive than the traditional steel. Uh, the fact that you require a lot less of it actually allows you to reduce the direct cost associated with those materials. So it's a win-win situation. And it's mostly a matter of bringing those materials into the uh, construction codes and regulations that are used by the nuclear industry because these materials are being used in other industries. So anyway, oh, those are... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I gave you a very long answer there. But so, so these are somewhat mundane... I don't even want to call them innovations, but measures that you can take to reduce the cost. And you appreciate none of this has anything to do with the reactor itself. It's not a nuclear <laughs> engineering question. It's, a, it's a, almost like a civil engineering question. No, for sure. I, th- I think there's a, you know, a lot of uh, advocacy around the idea of you know, restoring the national labs uh, to a state where you, know, you can actually not just run simulations on novel reactor designs, but actually build prototypes. But Again, the focus of, of the support seems to be more on the construction side. And I understand um, G. Hitachi is working with TVA to um, actually do some preliminary work, I think, with steel bricks um, and their kind of silo excavation, you know, for putting that big reactor pressure vessel underground. Um, are you aware of, uh, is that just kind of a one-off example or are there uh, more of these uh, prototyping for the construction side rather than the reactor side occurring, which which may give us hope for for future deployment and, and easing construction. Yeah, I, I'm aware of at least one more high profile example in Europe, and that's EDF. Um, so the the French utility uh, they have actually uh, uh, built a uh, nuclear grade. A building in uh, one of their research centers south to Paris with uh, steel bricks and steel plate composites to basically gather that experience and and uh, and and I suppose evaluate if in fact it's uh, advantageous from their point of view to start building nuclear plants with that technology. So they they clearly put you know the time and money into this to to evaluate if it's feasible. I don't know what they what the outcome of that evaluation is. Is they have concluded that the EPR two you know the next generation of their nuclear reactor or new world will actually use the steel bricks or the the steel plate composites or it will just use traditional reinforced concrete. But but it's it's significant that they have taken a serious look at the um, at, at, at the composites. Listen, I'm, I'm conscious of your hard stop in in a few minutes. Uh, but just maybe we'll finish up on the modularity and we might have to see if we can schedule a part two because there's a lot more I'd love to talk to you about. Um, you know, the modularity is often tied into the word small. Um, I understand the AP1000, maybe the ABWRs in Japan, but the AP1000 is one of the first modular designs. Uh, the AP600, I think it suffered from, a, you know, not having the same economy of scale. It was never built, but the whole rationale is it's modular. It's going to make up for its lower lifetime output by snapping together and being a very fast construction project. Um, what, was this, uh, is, is it possibly modular and large? Um, what, what's your take? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree, Chris. I don't think modularity is necessarily associated with small reactors. And you mentioned the AP1000, but the other one that you mentioned that is an even more significant experience is the ABWR, of which they built, I think, six or eight in Japan, and they use um, a modular construction that I've described uh, from from their first unit, and they and they saw a nice reduction in cost. The order of about twenty percent, which is significant. And 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 uh, some of these ABWRs in Japan, I think, are still the uh, uh, they still hold the record for the fastest construction. So th- there is a lot of good experience there, and it's uh, primarily with uh, with Itachi. Uh, which now, of course, is uh, you know an ally of uh, as an, an alliance in nuclear with uh, General Electric. So I'm I hope that for the BWRX 300, that's a smaller reactor, but they will fully benefit from that experience. Although, once again, the the experience and the know-how, and it's not like once you have them, you you keep them forever. You keep right? them forever, and, yeah. right? And so these plants in Japan were built well 20 years ago. So, as uh, people retired, uh, you know, was sort of. Uh, transfer of knowledge is is in place for uh, from those projects which were very successful to to the new GE Itachi projects uh, that are starting now in in uh, in North America and elsewhere I have a lot of worries about Japan having uh, you know basically thrown their nuclear industry into the deep freeze and being able to resuscitate it but maybe there's hope um, you know Italy obviously uh, 
you know, had a referendum to ban nuclear power, but there's still uh, a generation of pretty amazing uh, Italian physicists uh, seem to have a reputation for that. And yourself are a living example of someone who's who's working towards this goal and keeping the flame alight. Jacopo, uh, thank you for making the time today. Um, and I do hope to have you back in the near future for a, for a part two to dive a little deeper. Thank you, Chris. It's been a pleasure. Always fun to talk about these topics. So till next time. For sure. And if you have any shameless self-promotion or, or the uh, MIT course next year, I, the, the floor is yours for, for the next minute before you got to run. Well, this course is quite neat, and I consider it a little bit my baby because I, you know, I, I, I created it, um, I think, five years ago. So, yes, for those who are listening, if you have an interest in nuclear and you, you don't know much about it and you're willing to come to uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts for three days to learn about nuclear, both the, you know, the benefits and the issues, uh, the invitation is open. Uh, we typically hold this course in uh, early August, and uh, according to Chris, is valuable. So. Let us know um, if you have an interest, and uh, we'll be we'll be happy to invite you. Okay, wonderful, Jacopo. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye bye.